let's see. Here we go. Okay. All right. So I want to start uh, talking about the normal distribution. Um, hopefully this won't restart. Okay. So we want to look at these case study problems we were talking about last time, but we're going to have to do some more work and uh, develop some stuff about the normal distribution. Let me find my plugins here first. Okay, I need to find the cord that goes into here. Is it one? Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah, thanks. I need to find the H HDMI. It's HDMI, yeah. Okay. Nope. It's the other one. I saw it. Okay, thanks. All right. So I'm going to first of all um, review some things we did about the normal distribution. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through a little bit of stuff on the homework because the homework works the normal distribution differently than what we're going to do. And I intentionally didn't do it the way the book does it because they use tables and nobody uses tables, okay? <coughs> Especially not when we can use stat crunch. But, um, be, but uh, before I start on that, I want to talk about something that uh, Doug brought to my attention. This is something in finance. It, it's called a candlestick chart. And it's rather interesting. The way it works is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this isn't an aside, but it's something related to financial statistics. It's actually really interesting. Um, this is the behavior of a stock during the day. And what they do is you can see that throughout the day, the stock's doing a lot of different stuff, right? So how do you kind of summarize that information? There was a Japanese trader in, in, in rice commodities, and he came up with this idea that what you do is um, you plot the opening price, you make this little box, and the opening price is, is plotted at the bottom of the box, and the closing price is the top of the box, and then the minimum is kind of like the bottom of this whisker. I think they call it a broom. I don't remember the exact name. I'm sorry? Wick, yeah, thanks, yeah, yeah. So instead of a box and whiskers, these are called the wicks, and then the maximum price is here. And supposedly you can tell a lot by looking at this. I mean, you know, if you have a if you have a really long tail here, this means that a lot of the time the activity was spent below the uh, the opening price. And there's actually kind of an interpretation. And I don't, I'm not a stock forecaster, but it actually tells you uh, knowing the length of these tails. It usually tells you what happened with the history of the stock, like like when when trading increased, uh, when the when the when when the price went up. It's a very nice way of summarizing data, um, and the way they do it is you notice that the opening and closing, if they're switched right, uh, you know, then it's going to get kind of confusing. So what they do is when the, when when the price goes down, that is to say, when the close is uh, lower than the open, they they fill in the box. And with just the opposite, they leave the box open. And of course, they color it different ways. But the idea is they color those boxes two different ways, depending on the way that the um, uh, stock behaved with respect to its opening and closing behavior. And finally, they actually plot these things. And there's a, if you get into this, and I, I didn't, but if you get into this, there's a whole literature of how you interpret these trends. So this is kind of like a compressed time series. Instead of plotting, and it's actually a very nice way of looking at it. Because if you were to plot all of that data for all of those time periods, for all of those days, it would be really hard to read some useful information necessarily because there are a lot of jitters throughout the day. And you're interested kind of in how the stock's trending. And there's a whole, there's a whole Bible about, you know, different, if you have a pattern that looks like this, it means this. If it looks like this, it, it looks like it's, it's that. So that's, that's kind of interesting. I just want to mention as an aside, because this can be relevant to some of you. If you ever have things that you're thinking about or working on, projects, stuff like that, that involve statistics, always feel free to come to me. So I work with a lot of students on projects. Professionally, I find it very rewarding. I get to learn about new stuff all the time. It helps you, okay? There aren't that many people at this university that actually know how to practice statistics who are actually statisticians, very, very few. Um, but also, it, it, it really is good because it helps the student body. This is a really unique university, right? And that we're very, very focused, which is great. So chances are, if you have a, if you have a project that you're working on, 
can I help you? It's going to be relevant to other students. I can incorporate that into uh, things that I'm going to do in the future. Okay? And that's what I try to do now. Um, I, I try to find examples that I think are relevant. I could just teach in the book. Anyone that even has a modicum of background in mathematics can do that. Okay, But I, I try to use what I know, because I've worked with the Air Force for a long time, and kind of base it on what your interests are, to, to, to give you something that you can actually use. This won't just be a, a requirement. So something to think about. A, a second aside that's rather interesting is this notion of normalization of deviance. So there's this idea in psychology that you can have an organization where people are, are so accustomed to bad behavior that they don't even question it. Even though if you ask them objectively, is this wrong, if you put it in the context with someone else, they would immediately identify it's wrong, right? And you see this with corporate greed. There's the old saying, the fish rots from the head down. Okay, so when it's, when it's, when it's attractive, it's systemic. People just kind of tolerate it. And I've been thinking about this. I'm not sure that I totally understand it yet because it's kind of related to some things that people do when they make decisions that are well known in psychology. There's this thing called the hot hand fallacy. Anyone that's ever gone to Las Vegas, you see this. Where someone is really successful for a couple of rounds in blackjack, poker, or whatever, and they continue to think just because they were successful, they're going to continue to be successful. And I have a feeling that goes into a little bit of normalization of deviancy. People engage in risky behavior, they don't get caught, they're think, they think they're probably going to be able to continue to get away with it, and they keep, they keep doing it, you know. But there's also a thing called in, increased risk tolerance, which basically says things we're familiar with, even if they're risky, we don't fear. Like lion tamers probably don't, don't fear lions, even though we would, because they feel like they have a measure of, of competency, right? And things that we're unfamiliar with, we tend to amplify those risks. Like everybody gets in a car, and very few people worry about getting into a fatal car accident. But almost everyone in this room, I'm sure, even though there's a lot of people in aeronautics, you get into a commercial jet, uh, you know, the thought goes through your head that it might crash. Even though you know you might not be afraid of flying, that thought goes through your head. Even though the probability is much, much less that you're going to be in a plane than you're going to be in a car crash. So I, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I'm still thinking about this, but um, the, 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 you know the reason why it's interesting in this example is that there probably was normalization of deviancy going on because more because NASA definitely knew there was not data on what was going to happen. They totally knew that. And what by called came, came right out and told them. Even though they gave them the assurance that, yeah, we have a backup system and it will work. They knew the primary system could fail. They, they were very, very clear. And yet they and yet they went ahead with it. Yeah. What is the whole um, generalization of agency with the challenger example mean that there was possibly other problems for challengers so like being purged and the house brush that off as well? Exactly. So it raises the question of when were all of those other times? Because in order to have normalization of deviancy, you have to have past examples where you did the same thing. Where were all those other examples? And you know, if you read about the Challenger, I didn't know anything about it really until I started preparing this lecture. You, you realize that there were a lot of things with the Challenger that were kind of shaky. There were a lot of repairs that were doing at the, at the, at the last minute. And you know, the reality is this. The, the reality is that from a purely probabilistic point of view, the probability of a fatal accident probably was very, very low. Okay? Objectively, there probably wasn't a high probability of an accident. If it hadn't been for like that jet stream in that little instance dislodging that hot metal, booster rockets only last for like eight minutes, right? Chances are, you know, after the rockets had cut off, they wouldn't have undergone an impact. That metal wouldn't have been hot. It wouldn't have caused that problem. It wouldn't have had all that, all that fuel, right? So, I mean, it's just, it's one of those weird chance coincidences. They probably would have been okay, just like they probably were those other 20 times or however many times they, they did it, you know. But it's, it's, it's kind of interesting how people perceive risks and, and stuff like that. So anyhow, I just thought that was kind of cool. All right, but back to the normal distribution. Okay, so these are the main things that we have to know, okay? We have to know... Again, what the population mean and standard deviation symbols are, what they stand for, how we symbolically write a normal distribution, and I'm gonna I'm gonna write it this way from now on. 
And again, the basic property. It goes on forever. It's symmetric, bell-shaped, okay? It, the key thing, the key thing though, and, and I should write this out explicitly, I, I'll change the notes to reflect it, is that the key thing about the normal distribution is it follows the empirical law exactly. The empirical rule is a rule of thumb. It holds approximately for any mild shape symmetric. For the standard normal, it's exact. For any, any normal distribution, it's 68, 95, 99.73. It's exact. And that's what makes a normal distribution the uh, normal distribution. Okay. Again, how we're going to sketch any normal distribution, we're going to put the mean in the center, go out three units of standard deviation, and of course we'll be filling in numbers, whatever those are in a problem. The empirical rule, and actually, um, in, you know, again, to be really technically correct, it's like 99.73%, three standard deviations from the mean, and that's, and that's exact. Okay, z-scores, we're all familiar with how they are, what, what they are. The key thing about z-scores, the one thing that you want to know is what a z-score is. A z-score is simply the number of standard deviations you are above or below the mean. That's it. Okay. I mean, you can use this, you can use this fancy formula, but really all this is, the interpretation is just the number of standard deviations above or below the mean. Right? If you're below the mean, what do you know about the z-score? It's negative. It's negative, right. So if you're below mu, and, and, and you can see why that is, right? If the x is below mu, this is going to be negative, and of course standard deviation is always positive, right? If you're above mu, it's going to be positive. Okay? If you're at mu, you get zero. All right. And so the idea is that we want to be able to compute these things for instances where the, where the empirical rule doesn't hold. In other words, it's very, very rare that you get a data value that's exactly an integer number of standard deviations from the mean. So we want to look at the stat crunch and have it do it for us. The important thing, and again, I, I, I should probably be a little more clear, just to, just to amplify this, that when x has a normal distribution, the z-scores have a normal distribution. And they have a standard normal distribution, okay? Meaning that <coughs> mu is zero and sigma is one. So let me just write this down because this is going to be an, an important thing for us. Is that when x has a any normal distribution, it automatically follows that the z-scores have a standard normal. And this is the definition of a standard normal. It's the only named normal distribution. It's the only normal distribution that we name. The reason why is because every normal distribution, if we want to compare two normal distributions, goes through the standard normal. Okay. And, and, and we're going to see that this fact is useful even when x doesn't come from a normal distribution. We're going to see that there's still an application for this fact, which is really amazing. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to practice a little bit with standard normal, just to do some calculations and kind of get you familiar with the sort of questions and problems. So the first thing we could have is we could have some z-score. This is where we left off last time. We were looking at some, at some data values and we wanted to find out some z-scores. So we were given that x came from a normal distribution with a mean of 525 and a standard deviation of 100, okay? And we wanted to know what were the z-scores for, for some different data values. I want to know what is the z-score. So I'm just going to use the fact that this tells me what the mean is, and this tells me what the standard deviation is, and so the z-score is going to be whatever this data value is, Right, minus 525 over 100. And we did this last class, but I'll go ahead and finish it out, right? It's going to be, what, uh, 235 over 100. 
or 2.35. This is going to be my z-score. This is telling me that this data values 2.35 standard deviations above the mean. And you should check yourself, right? This is, this is above the mean. The z-score is positive. That makes sense. Okay. What if we have 400? So you know already that 400 is below the mean, so I'm going to get a negative z-score, right? Just plug this in. I'm going to get 400 minus 525 over 100. So now it'll give me minus 125 over 100, or minus 1.25. One thing to be careful about when you do calculations is that z-scores generally don't have a magnitude larger than 3. Now you're going to find out on that baseball example that's not true, okay? But generally, those are the, the uh, z-scores that you're going to see for that baseball example are, are exceptional. One of them is over 12, which I've never seen in any other application. But generally, the absolute value of z is less than 3. Very, very rare. How do we know that? When we're working with a normal distribution, the empirical law tells us, right, that 99, that 0.27% that satisfy this condition. That tells you that's a very rare event, right? Okay, last one, 550. Just put this into our formula. You can do this in, you know, Excel or Stat Crunch, doesn't matter. Over 100, and we get 25 over 100, so 0.25. Okay. This is how we get z scores. Okay. So, what we want to do now is something a little bit different. A, a key fact to, to keep in mind is that whenever we're working with z scores, or whenever we're working with a normal distribution, we're either doing one of two things. We're either being asked for the percentile of the data value, or we're given the percentile and want to know what is the data value. And when you're working a problem, that's the first thing you should ask yourself. That helps you get your bearings, okay? So we're either going from a data value to a percentile, or we're going from a percentile to a data value. And we always go through the, in a sense, we always go through the z-score. Okay, it's the intermediary. And sometimes you have to go through the z-score. There's just no other way. Okay, so it's important to remember that when we ask the probability of getting a certain value, we're not asking the probability that we get exactly that value. I'm always talking about the percentile. That's what we mean. It makes no sense to talk about for a, a continuous quantitative variable, it makes no sense to talk about the probability that you get someone that has exactly a, a certain score, okay? Because we know that if we think about a population, that's gonna be zero, all right? Okay. <coughs> SATs, SATs are, are a little bit, are a little bit um, of, uh, are, are, are a little bit atypical in the sense that they're not really continuous, they're actually discrete. So we're modeling it as continuous, which we, which we do a lot of times. But for a truly continuous variable, it makes no sense to talk about that, okay? And percentiles are always areas in tails, okay? So here's what I want to do. We're going we're gonna to get into the habit of doing this, because this is going to be an important exercise. We're going to actually start shading in the areas corresponding to these, to these percentiles, okay? So what I'm going to do, I don't, know the, I don't know the percentile yet, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sketch, and it doesn't really matter what you do. In this case, um, I'm going to sketch the standard normals, okay? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to sketch the standard normal distribution. I'm going to sketch three of them because I have three scores. And I'm going to shade in the area corresponding to the percentile. Okay. And I'm going to um, put the z-score of each data value. Uh, 
on the plot. And then I'm going to shade in the area for the percentile. For that data values percentile. So you're going to see them on stat crunch and you're going to see this in the in the book a lot and it's important because when we go to do inference when we start to do hypothesis tests we have to kind of think this way so let me kind of just illustrate let's just look at the first one okay so for x equal to 760 we found out the z-score was 2.35 so the, the, the standard normal is going to look like this right it's just zero one, two, three. The reason why we know that is because we know that the standard normal has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So it's going to look like this. And my data value is right here. It's 2.35. Just use your calibrated eyeball. Now, there's one thing that's not obvious that's going to be important, which is that when we're talking about percentiles, we're always talking about areas in the, in the, in the scale. Technically, the percentile for this value is the probability you have a value less than 2.35. When we do inference, however, the way we want to think about this is the probability we could get a value that extreme or more extreme. So when we have a data value, that's above the mean, we're going to think about its upper percentile. Okay, So for data values that are above the mean like this, in other words, uh, their z-scores are positive, right? The percentile that we're generally going to think of is the upper percentile. And when they're below the mean, it's just the straight percentile, which by default, the, the lower percentile. So this is the area that I'm going to be interested in right here. This is the probability of a randomly chosen z-score being greater than 2.35. And that's the area. So remember that when we're working with here. Is that a little easier to see? Okay. So when we're, when we're working with probabilities, probabilities of areas, and we're interested in probabilities of tails, so we're interested in areas of tails, okay? So that's important to understand, that probabilities are areas, I'm interested in the probability in the, in the tail of the data value. So this means that I'm interested in the area of the data values tail. Okay. So this is the area in the in the tail. If you remember that, you never have to worry about above and below. Okay. And we haven't figured this out. We're going to use stat crunch to do this. But you can use tables also. I'm going to try not to do that. OK? All right, let's try. Um, I'll tell you, we can, we can do them on the same one. I'll, I'll, I'll do it on the same one. So the other one has a z-score of minus 1.25, right? So we go down here. Okay, so my other z-score is, is minus 1.25, right? So b was the data value of 400, and the z-score was minus 1.25. So I'm going to go ahead and find that. Okay. And the area I'm going to be interested in is the area of the tail. This is going to be the straight percentile, right? So this is going to be the area that I want. 
The mathematical probability statement for this is that the probability of randomly chosen z-score is less than minus 1.25. These two things are equal. This probability is equal to this area. I'm sorry? Probability is less than 1.5%. This is an actual z-score. So this is saying, what is the probability that a randomly chosen z-score is less than minus 1.25? So these are my z-scores here, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you have to be careful when you're, when you're working with percentages and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay. So this is a, this is a z-score. Okay. Um, last one. We have 550. And we found out the z-score here was 0.25. So I go ahead and find that z-score. I think it's right here. <clears throat> and the percentile here, since it's above the mean, it, the, the, the uh, tail, the shorter part's here. So this is going to be the area that I'm interested in right here. And it's the whole thing. And so this area is equal to the probability a randomly chosen z-score is greater than the given z-score of 0.25. And these pictures, while they're a little cumbersome to draw, are actually going to be really useful when we do inference, help us understand what's, what's going on, okay? So any, any questions about um, the calculations, the picture, what it represents? how the areas are tied to the probability, what the relationship is. Everybody's good on this? Okay. So let's see how to actually do this, okay? <clears throat> so now we want to actually compute these. And, and, we're, and we're just going to use StatCrunch, okay? So we're going we're gonna to go to StatCrunch. <sighs> Come on. Okay. There you go. All right. And, and on the problems, and I'll go through a problem in the book with the tables, but I suggest you not use the tables. What, can, what, might, what might happen is the tables are, are rounded off. So StatCrunch gives you an exact answer. The tables of these probabilities rounded off to like four decimal places. You might get a little bit of round off error. Okay, in other words, the tables might be less accurate than StatCrunch. It might give you an error, and then all you have to do is just change the rounding a little bit. I don't think that will happen. I've tried a number of them, and they come out exactly the same, but that could happen. It's unlikely. But really, nobody nobody really uses tables for this anymore. It's very 1990-ish. Okay, let's, let's go to StatCrunch. And, and one of the other reasons why I really love StatCrunch, if, if it was just a matter of computing the value, I'd probably use the book because you know, it gives you the tables and it's easier just to follow the book. But I, I want to show you what, what the what the StatCrunch program does that I think is really cool. So you don't have to load any data. Just go to stat and go to calculator. Oh, something did something happen? Thanks. Oh, you know what happens when it loads a program? Sometimes it, it blanks out the screen. Thanks. Sorry about that. It should work now. Just give it a give it a second. All right. Let's try one more time. I don't think this went out. And I can actually do this on the thing, but it's just, but then I'll lose the recording of the screen, which I don't want to do. Okay. Let's try it. 
this. Okay. Yep, it should come on in a second. There we go. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to open up StatCrunch and just go to Stat and hit Calculator. And this calculator works for a lot of different distributions. So, you, so I kind of like this because it gives you a sense of the fact that we're only working with one of many distributions. Most of these are actually used in, in, in business. We're just going to deal with the normal. And so you notice how, how this works out. So it actually gives you a picture of, this, of the standard normal, okay? But it asks you what the mean and the, and the standard deviation are. So you can change it. So let's just go ahead. Um, we'll do the standard normal first, okay? So let's go ahead and compute the probability that we get a z-score greater than 2.35. So first of all, I have to tell it what distribution to work with. So notice I already have the mean of 0 and the standard deviation of 1 because I'm working with z-scores, right? Yeah? So like, where does it take place after calculating? Normal. There's a whole list of them, yeah, a whole, a whole laundry list, yeah. Okay, and it should give you a screen like this, a pop-up screen. So we know that our, our mean is zero, our standard deviation is one. We don't have to change that. So then I'm going to come down here, and in the score, I'm going to put 2.35. Whoops. And I'm going to change this to greater than or equal to. All right. And notice what it did. It actually plotted the same thing that I just plotted here except more accurate, and it gave me that value. It tells me that the probability in this tail is, and this is not expressed as a, as a percentage, it's a straight probability, 0 0.009386. Now, when you get this in the table, and this is where this round off error can occur, right? What will happen is the table will only go out to four decimal places. So the table will have 0 0.0094 if you look this up in a table. And it, it has you do which one? Yeah, because that's all the table has. And so, and so that's actually one reason why the table is bad. So that's actually one reason why the table is bad. But what might happen when you do the calculations with, with, with uh, stat crunch this way is that difference might cause your answer to be different. So if, for example, you compute a value using the, the, the calculator on StatCrunch and you get the wrong answer, just change the last digit up and down, and one of those has to work. The round off error is not that significant. It's not going to be more than, than one decimal place either way. So if you would enter, just as an example, let's suppose um, the answer that you, that you give, and, 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 and it actually forces you to round it off but what happens in a lot of problems, without getting too far afield, is sometimes you're taking the difference of two areas, right? When you take the difference of two areas, then this difference can matter. So if you enter a value, I'm just going to make up something, okay? 0 0.5216 is what you find out through StatCrunch. And then it tells you it's wrong. Just try 0 0.5217 and try 0.5215. And I'll, and I'll give you guys five, five chances. I think right now there's three, but just because you might have to use a few more bullets, you know, to try these two. And one of them has to work. I, again, I don't anticipate it will happen. I haven't seen any instances, but it, but it can. Okay. Um, and, and, and one thing is true. It definitely won't happen when you're computing probabilities and tails. Where it will happen is when you're taking areas um, in the middle and you have to subtract two areas or you're taking the areas in two tails. That's when it will happen. But for a single tail, you'll never have that problem. You shouldn't. If you do, there's something fundamentally wrong. Tell me. OK, so that's, that's our answer. And we can keep doing this, right? I can do this for the other ones. But, but here's what I want to show you. Just to convince you that this makes sense, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to compute the probability for 760. We should get the same answer, right? So this is kind of an interesting thing to think about for a second. Remember where this came from. <laughs> this is actually the probability that x was greater than 760. Okay. When I thought about x as coming from a normal distribution, 
with a mean of 525 and a standard deviation of 100. And if you plug these in, you'll get the same answer. Okay. So let me just convince you. Let's change the mean to 525 and change the standard deviation to 100 and then change this to 760. Okay. So notice I'm, I'm changing the normal distribution now, but I should still get the same answer. And we compute that. And notice it's the same answer. Why? Because the z-score is the same. You just transform the variable. Yeah? Yeah. And absolutely. So for example, in fact, we can we can we can look at this one right here. So let's go ahead and look at uh, minus one point two five. And here's but here's the general principle. So here's the here's the here's the principle. And this is gonna segue into hypothesis tests. So pretty soon <coughs> we're gonna start looking at stuff like this Morton Biocall example, okay? And we want to know, we're going to take a batch of these dyes, and we want to know what is the average temperature to which they fail, okay? Now, suppose, for example, they're, they're manufactured to fail at, say, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That's what Morton Biocall writes on the outside of the product, okay? We know for a fact that, that, that batch will not be 28 degrees Fahrenheit, right? There's going to be variation. The problem is, how much variation are you allowed before you say things don't look right? Okay, so what, what's, what's going to happen? We're going to use a hypothesis test when we get a batch at 26. That's well, actually, it's higher. Right, we want to fail higher. We're going to be worried. Well, that won't work out with your example. But um, uh, okay, let's okay, let's suppose it was cereal. I'll take something that's easy to think about. And they say there's 28 ounces, uh, 20 grams, whatever, in a thing of cereal. You get it, 20 grams, right? I'm trying to think of an example that's going to be low. Okay? So anyhow. Maybe it's, maybe it's 26. You want to know how likely is it that I could get a value that extreme or more extreme? And that's what the percentile is, okay? So when you're looking at a value that's that's lower than the mean, you want to know, like for example, in this case with cereal or short person, whatever, right? What is the probability I could get a person that short or shorter? That less filled or worse, okay? And that's the evidence for or against you meeting that standard. When the percentile is really low, you say it's too, it's too unlikely. Like when it gets to 1% or whatever, right? You say, I don't believe the manufacturer's claim. This is what we're actually doing. We're testing the probability we get a value this, ex this, this extreme or more extreme. And that's why we're testing the, 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 the pales. It's not obvious because you say, why are you interested in the percentile here, but you're not interested in the percentile here? Right? You should be. That's the reason why. That's where we're kind of headed with that. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Well, let, let, let's go ahead and do it, though. Let's just plug this in. So if we go over to um, StatCrunch, make this zero, make this one, and this was minus 1.25, and I want to change this to less than, okay? So that this little thing changes, right? change that to less than, and it automatically computes it, but I'll do it again. It's 0.105. A few things, and one of the reasons why the, this, this drawing is nice, and the thing you should be thinking about is doing this, you should be mentally checking yourself. So I know the value is less than the mean. The v-score should be negative, but what can you mess up? You can accidentally forget to change this, right? Probabilities in the tails are always less than 0.5. If you, if you leave this greater than or equal to, what will happen? Well, let me ask you a question. If the probability is roughly 10.6% in the lower tail, what is the probability in the upper tail? Is 10.6 in the lower? Right, it's going to be roughly 90 something. So when you start to see numbers above 0.5, chances are you messed up, right? You're actually looking at that. Some problems may ask you that, but just be careful, okay? Use that as kind of a kind of a guide, all right? Look at what the problem is asking. Okay. And that's all there is to 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 computing these these values. That's it. Okay. 
the 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 the, the only thing that StatCrunch won't do, but you're going to have to do by hand, and there's no way around it, unfortunately, is it it won't tell you the probability that you're between two values. Okay, so for so for example, let's just let's just work out an example. Um, So suppose, for example, you know, if let's we'll we'll just go back to our SAT example just for a minute, okay? I think it doesn't it doesn't really go up to eight twenty five, right? But that's that's okay. Okay. So suppose I want to know the probability. That someone has a score between 400 and um, say 700, and you see these sorts of things. Yeah, the um, Dougie. How how do you do it with this though? Go to the uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Ah, oh, that's so cool. I didn't see that. Thank you. There, there, there you go. Oh, I like that. Okay, well, never mind. Thank you. Okay, I didn't see that. I was going to say, because I've seen that on other programs. Okay, so never mind. Um, but th this sort of stuff comes up a lot. How many people are applying to like business schools or law schools and stuff, stuff like that? Okay. You see the court ties. They give the court ties, right? Actually, they don't even report the average in a lot of cases. They, they end up giving the, the, the court ties. These are the median and the court ties. This is what they're basically getting at, okay? All right, thanks. So yeah, so you would just put these two values in, put the correct mean and standard deviation, and give it to you. Thanks. That makes life a lot easier. Um, but this is where the caveat applies, okay? Um, and the only thing, and the one thing it won't do, I can say this now, is it won't give you the probability in, 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 in two tails. And eventually we're gonna have to deal with that. But we'll jump off that bridge when we come to it. Okay. So any questions about computing probability with StatCrunch? And StatCrunch will go the other way. So remember we said we're either given a data value, we want the percentile, or vice versa. StatCrunch will go the other way. If you give it the percentile, it will give you the data value. And we'll do a few of those types of problems also, OK? All right. So we just computed the percentiles of those. Um, so this is a variation of a problem that happens sometimes. Sometimes you're given the z-score and you want to know the data value. So let me, let me show you how this happens, okay? Here's, here's the context of the problem, the full problem. Sometimes you're given the percentile for a data value. Okay, so this is what you're given. And you want to know what is the actual data value. And for example, in real life, this is what you would do. If, for example, you're going to, you're going to reject the top 1% in weight of some, of some product, okay? You're not going to tell someone who works on an assembly line, hey, Joe, when the z-score is above, you know, minus 2.5, reject it. Nobody talks that way. What would you do? You would compute the actual weight, right, and say when it's above this weight, okay, and that weight would happen to correspond to the first percentile. So what you're going to do, the whole problem is we're going to go from the percentile to the z-score, and StatCrunch is going to do this for us, okay. But then once we get the z-score, we'll want to go to the actual data value, okay. So we're going to we're going to get the z-score. We're also going to have to be given the, the, the mean and the standard deviation. So these are three things we have to be given. No matter which way you're going, you have to be given the mean and the standard deviation. Okay. So once we have the, the, uh, the uh, z-score, let's suppose that we know what it is. How do we get the data value? Well, if you look at the formula for the z-score, right, you compute this from the percentile. 
right? This is what stat crunch gives you. And you're given these, these two things. These have to be given. In fact, you can't do the stat crunch calculation, right? Okay, so now you just go ahead and solve for x. So all you do is you just solve for x. So you, you multiply both sides by sigma, right? And of course, when you multiply by sigma, what happens? Well, these guys cancel out, right? And you end up getting <laughs> and all you do is you add mu to both sides, right? <coughs> and that's going to be the, the, the formula for that data value. Which makes perfect sense. And this is a beautiful formula because it really explains what the z-score is. It says, okay, if you want to get to x, start off with mu and go this many standard deviations above or below the mean. That's what the z-score is, right? That's telling you how many standard deviations. So really, you don't have to even do the algebra. Just thinking about what the z-score is tells you automatically this, this formula. Really understanding the z-score tells you that this has to be the answer. Although you can go through the algebra too. Okay? All right, any questions about that? So, so let's go ahead and, and, and work this problem. So here we're, here we're given we're, we're given the z-score. So we're given that z is minus 1.87. We're given that the mean is 9 and the standard deviation is 4. And we want to know what is the data value corresponding to z. And so I'm just going to use this formula. x is equal to mu plus z times sigma. So we're going to assume that we know this now. This is something that we can use, right? And I'm just going to substitute my values in, right? So I have 9 plus minus 1.87 times 4. And just go ahead and calculate that out really quick. And my calculator is acting up. Well, anyhow, we know this is going to be, this, this isn't hard to do, right? Minus 2 is minus 8. 0 0.03 times this is um, 0.12, so it's minus 7.88. Is that, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, minus 7.88. Is that what people get? It's like it's 7.48. 4, 8. Whoops, what did I do wrong? Oh, oh yeah, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, okay. Okay. So yeah, that's 1.52. Okay. So I go ahead and I just subtract from 97.48. And that's right. We get 1.52. And that's and that's my data value. Okay. So that's 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 all there is. We just plug the values in and go ahead and, and, and compute it. Okay. Okay, so last uh, last last problem for today. We'll 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 stop early, okay? We'll stop a little early. Um, so suppose you're given a data value, you're told it's in, it's in the 96th percentile, okay? What is the, the uh, mean of x? So this is, a little, this is a little trickier. Let's see, did I give you... Yeah, okay. So here's what, so here's what we know. So we're given that x comes from a normal distribution. And we don't know the mean, bless you, but we know the standard deviation is 4. Okay? 
And we know that some data value that's 100 has a z-score of, well, no, we, we know that this is um, 100, and we're told that it is in the 96th percentile. And so the question is, what is, what is mu? I want to figure out what is the what is the mean. Okay. So I'm going to use this information to get the z-score. Okay. If I go back and I look at this relationship, right? I know that um, x is equal to mu plus z times sigma. Okay. I know x and I know sigma, and I can figure out the z-score from knowing the percentile, okay? Because the z-score is independent of the, of the distribution. That's the whole point. So I'm gonna I'm gonna find the z-score. So this is this is given. This is given. And I'm gonna figure out this z-score by using the fact that this is in the 96th percentile. So I'm gonna find the z-score for the 96th percentile. And then I'm just going to solve for mu. So we're going to use stat crunch for that. <laughs> Bless you. So I'm going to have to keep the mean at zero and standard deviation at one. I don't know the mean, right? And I'm going to have to use standard. And uh, I don't know what this value is, but I do know what the probability is. And I want to be careful. I want this to be less than, right? So notice that when you calculate, when you put in the percentile as as a, as a as a probability, what stat crunch returns is the z score. Okay. So I, I told it start with the mean of zero, standard deviation of one, that's that's the z score. Find the Find it, of course they use X for everything, right? But this, this is Z in our mind. Find the Z score less than some value, I didn't fill that in, and that probability is 0.96. And it gives me the value. I didn't know it was less than Oh, because it, 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 it told me it was a 96 percentile. So by default, percentile is always, always a probability less than. Yeah. Okay. When we want to specify the upper percentile, we have to say it explicitly. Okay, so this is my this is my z score, and we'll, we can round it off. Okay, so stat crunch tells us we use the probability that z is less than we leave this blank is equal to 0.96, and stat crunch gives us a z score of what is 1.74, and we, we will we'll just round it off. Okay, and all I do is just put all these things in. Okay, so I'm told that this is 100. I don't know mu. I know this is 1.71, and this is going to be times 4 for my standard deviation, right? So I'm just going to get, what, 6.4 for that guy. And now I'm just going to go ahead and solve for mu. That's my final answer. That's the value for you when you get that. Okay. This is one of two problems that's not easy, or maybe not as obvious. The other problem is this, and this is actually the important one. Suppose you suppose you know that a manufacturing process has a certain standard deviation. And you want to make sure that only a certain percentage are below a certain value. Where should you set the mean? Okay, so we're going to come to we're going to come back to this problem. This is a good problem to think about. Just uh, before I erase this, any questions? Everybody good on this? Okay. Here's so here's the problem we're going to think about next time. We'll, and we'll 
we'll, we'll stop for the moment on this one. So here's the, here's the basic problem. I want to make sure, if you go back to the O-rings, for example, I might want only a very small percentage to be below 32 degrees. So NASA comes to me and says, you know what, we want less than 0.1% of your O-rings to fail, okay? So this is less, this would be less than 0.1%. And I know the standard deviation. Um, very often the standard deviation is fixed by the machine. The machine only has a certain level of accuracy no matter where it's set. The question is, where should mu be? Okay. In other words, you think that you can kind of like move this distribution around, right? Where should you center it so that you're you're guaranteed, or you're insured that less than 0.1% of your values would be less than 32. That's a fun problem to think about. Think about that problem, how you would solve that. It's not so easy, but it's kind of a variation of what we just did, right? You're solving for mu, but that's a kind of fun problem. Okay, so just really briefly, what we're gonna do next time is we're gonna finish up looking at the standard normal. We're gonna have the in-class portion of the exam. Um, I don't think we'll get to the case studies. We'll probably do them after, after we come back from the book. We'll see how much time we have. Okay? All right, thank you. Did you said there was going to be a focus for the exam, right? I'm sorry? Did you say there was going to be a study sheet or like a focus oh, for the exam? You were I, did, I did post that. Did everyone see a study sheet? Yeah. Just to make sure. Um, it, it